Andreas, how should a patient prepare for their ERCP? That's a very good question, Doug, because I think that they need to know what they're getting into. So it's not only the understanding of the procedure, but it's extremely important also to understand what the medical history of the patient is. One of the scenarios that we see the most that it's very important in preparing for the procedure, it's what medications are you taking now? And the ones that we as interventional endoscopists fear the most, it's a patient taking blood thinner medications and nobody telling them that they need to stop. Because if we're gonna be cutting, removing stones, putting stents, this can induce bleeding. So it's important to get a good history. It's important to be in communication with the primary care doctors and particularly the cardiologists when they're taking blood thinner medications. So as a group, we can make a decision when to stop and when to continue certain medications. I'm saying as a group, but we also have strict guidelines that we know we're gonna tell a patient, stop the medication, for example, Coumadin, a couple of days before, but it's always good, and for us, it's regular in our practice to have the patients involved and us involve their cardiologists to make a joint decision. If the procedure is urgent, there's not too much room to make this type of decisions, but when the procedure is selective and it can wait, we can wait a couple of weeks or months to do the procedure if okay with the rest of the team. How about immediately before the procedure? Besides the medications, what else should the patient look to do prior to coming to the hospital? That's another very important question because we want to have a patient mentally prepared for a procedure that it's a little bit invasive as we're going to talk in a couple of uh, minutes. But we always explain the patient what the procedure entitles. We explain the patients that they need a ride. We explain the patients that they cannot make any major decisions the rest of the day. And uh, we tell the patients, listen, you have to be prepared, particularly when it's elective, that something may, be, may go wrong. It's not the norm, but it's good to be prepared psychologically from the patient's side to know that when things go wrong, we always keep the patient, or when the procedure it's a little bit more complicated than expected, that we may want to keep you overnight, and it's not a bad idea to bring extra clothing or so with you just in case we want to keep you in observation. I think it's, it's important, too, to tell the patients that uh, this is a procedure that is going to go into their esophagus and stomach, and therefore any food or fluid that they may ingest prior to the procedure may restrict our ability to do, the, to do that procedure. So having somebody not eat or drink anything prior to the procedure is very important. There are many places that use anesthesiologists now, and they have strict guidelines on how and when people can eat and what they can eat. So certainly a solid meal should be last consumed at least midnight prior to the procedure. And any fluids that are ingested should be done at least four hours before. And that should be clear liquids, because there are, if we have an anesthesiologist involved, even chewing gum or drinking milk and some coffee or tea may limit their ability to provide sedation, and that may then delay the procedure that day or even be canceled until the next day. So I think that's an important part of the uh, preparation for the patient. They also need to talk to their physicians about their blood sugar medication, certainly if they're diabetic, that they need to have a, a complete understanding of when and if they should take oral medications and when and if they should take their insulin. Typically, the patients are given about half their dose of insulin prior to coming. So, but that needs to be clearly spelled out by the uh, primary care physician prior to their coming. And as I, I agree 100% with you on the blood thinner situation, because that, that may preclude what we can do. Certainly in an elective situation, that decision can be made before. In an emergent situation, we often have to go ahead and do the procedure anyways, but it may increase the risk and it may limit what we're able to do. Rather than doing any cutting or definitive procedure, we may have to temporize to take care of the patient at that point in time, rather than doing something that we can complete the procedure right then and there, and the patient would have to come back on, an, on another occasion. So I think we have to clearly identify those, uh, those factors. I also think, Doug, that many of us and many practices are giving the patients checklist so to remind them what to do and what not to do to prevent these problems. 
Frequently, patients don't remember, or the family members, all the conversation that we had. So checklists, it's something that we encourage patients, even if they go to a different practice, to ask to prevent this type of last minute problems. Right. So one of the big things, we have that same situation where we have a checklist. I would encourage patients to actually look at it as they schedule the appointment, rather than waiting for a couple hours before the, the procedure. Of the procedure. Exactly, because these things are very important. We'll help them get through the procedure and prepare effectively. So if they have the checklist, the list of recommendations beforehand, if there is a question about medication or about a ride or about what the procedure is, they can feel free to call the physician to ask those questions mm -hmm. so that they have a complete understanding of what is expected of them and what is expected of us. So I think that's a, that's a clear-cut uh, thing that a patient can, can do proactively. 